Good morning, church. And welcome to worship on this glorious winter morning. Just sharing with Rob there, it felt like we burst into spring. But it's back to winter this morning. We're feeling the, uh, the freshness of the air. How wonderful it is to be gathered together in God's house to worship the Lord our God, to give praise and testimony to the faithfulness of our loving and gracious God. Our very presence together here this morning bears witness to who God is. We're going to be sharing a little later in the service uh, at the beginning of our series on the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, we're going to commence using Paul's list in order with love. And I wanted to suggest to you today that uh, the expression of the fruit of the Spirit is like walking into a house of mirrors. Given that the echo is on, one of my favourite things that I used to love, well, apart from the ghost train, was going into the house of mirrors where you get lost in this maze and all you see is all these reflections, <laughs> like infinite reflections, and trying to find your way out. I want to suggest to you that our expression of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives is a reflection of Christ dwelling within us. So with that word of encouragement, let us join together in singing the first of our songs this morning. Please stand with me as you are able. Let us sing. Mm. Church here in this place. 
who stirs us up to be the people that you've called us to be. And God, we are so grateful for being able to gather together freely to worship you, for the community that we experience together, sharing with one another your amazing grace, your loving faithfulness. And God, we thank you that the presence of your Spirit in our lives is evident in the fruit that we bear. We thank you for the characteristics of Jesus Christ that we see in one another. Help us, Lord God, to be an encouragement and an inspiration to each other. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you have poured out upon our lives over this past week. Things that have been quite miraculous, things that have been rather ordinary, but in which we have seen your hand at work. God, we are so grateful, so grateful that you call us sons and daughters. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, who makes it possible for us to enter into your presence. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for life everlasting. We thank you for the gift of your Spirit who bears witness to these truths. God, we are thankful. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. And in response this morning, we praise and glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lots of things happening across the life of our church family at this point in time. It's my privilege to invite John to come and share with us the family news. Thanks, John. Thank you, Pete. That's really good to see you today. <laughs> uh, much better than you were this time last week, so that's, that's a great answer to the question. Yes, well, good morning, everyone. Great to, great to see you. The scroll is out today, of course, with uh, Sue so puts together faithfully each week and uh, news from the church council. One important thing is that uh, we're reinstating the prayer corner over here um, after service. If, uh, if you feel that you would like prayer, the duty elder for the day will, um, will be there to, uh, to pray with, with whoever comes. So. Please uh, make use of that. I think all the news is, is in the in the the scroll. Um, I mentioned last week. I'll mention it again that I went to Presbytery meeting not yesterday, but the Saturday before, and the moderator was there. And the moderator had a whole pile of these books, and he handed them out to everybody who wanted one. And so I actually finished up with two because I thought, well, one for me, but I've already got one, and one for Pete because he wasn't here. And well, we've got one for the congregation now too. So uh, this is the Voice to Parliament Handbook. It's been put out by Thomas Mayo and Kerry O'Brien. Uh, answers a lot of questions which people might have about the Voice. And of course, it's very much in the news at the moment. And uh, and to help uh, people understand it more, this handbook's there. So there's a couple of copies. This one and another one will be out there on the table field. Free to borrow them, bring them back, pass them around, have a read, have a talk about it with people so that we can be uh, led the way God wants us to vote when the time eventually comes. So I think that's probably it today. Any other announcements that people want to make? Yes, but, oh, it's next Saturday. is a paper of grafters, so uh, please uh, note that Saturday 26th, 10 to 4 pm. So. Uh, Great, thank you. Oh, we're going to have the offering, aren't we? <laughs> Your free offering will now be received. Uh, who's going to bother? Well, I think it was my, the duty elder's job to find people, but I didn't do that. Thank you. Thank you, Nala. <laughs> thank you, Pete. This, this is showing multi-skilling. Uh, when I was a minister once, I got the job of passing the plate around and I made a real mess of it. I thought, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> so I always have people smiling when you're asking them for money. <laughs> well,
Loving God, we praise you for all the good gifts you give us. And we have this opportunity to give of our, of our, our prosperity, of our wealth, of our hope and of our joy in sharing with other people through this giving of money and the giving of our lives. Take all we have and use to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. wasn't sure if I was next. I should have grabbed my um, microphone. But just before we do our children's talk, I want to give you a, a little story from the op shop this week, because it's really nice to know when you bless people. To me, that's part of the op shop, a big part of the op shop, is to bless people. A little while ago, a lady came in and um, she wanted to try on good dresses because she was going to her son's wedding and she was the mother of the groom and she was looking for something really nice and she tried on a couple of dresses and she took this particular one in to try on and the next thing she poked her head out of the um, change room and she said, can somebody please get the zip down on this dress and handed the dress out. Well, we tried everything to get this zip down. We tried just managing it. We put on one drop of oil. We got the, um, the stick, yes, we got the lead pencil. Um, we got the um, candle. Nothing would get the zip down on this dress. So I went in and I apologised to her. I said, I'm really sorry, I can't sell you the dress. We can't get the zip down. And um, she was really disappointed because she just loved this dress. She said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I can't do anything with it. I'm going to have to throw it away. And she said, oh. And I said, would you like it? Oh, yes, please. So I gave her the dress which we couldn't sell because we couldn't get the zip down. She came in on Monday this week and came to see me and said, I just want to show you some photos. And here she is in this dress looking a million dollars at her son's wedding. She went to a dressmaker, it cost her $54 to get a new zip put in the dress and she looked a million dollars. So it's so nice when you can bless people. That, which was something we couldn't use and which made her look beautiful. So I just thought you might like that little story this morning. Now, it's kids' talk for all you kids. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. How much love do you have to give to other people? A little bit or lots? Lots. So this one, bar. So we'll see how much love there is in this one, shall we? If I squeeze it into here. Or if I keep squeezing. Oh, and some more. Look, we've got it about half full, haven't we? So what about this one? Not as much in it, is there? Not as much love to give. But if I said to you that we have God's love and that you can dip in as many times as you like and God's love never runs out, we can keep dipping into his love. And we can keep filling ourselves up with his love until we are full to overflowing and his love never runs out. So when we're thinking of how much love we've got to give to others, remember that 
we need to dip in to God's love so that we can be full to overflowing with his love. Let's pray. We thank you, loving Lord God, that the truth of your word is simple that even a child can understand. We thank you for the limitlessness of your love. And we thank you that we are conduits of that love, vessels that can contain it and share it with others. God, we pray that as we open your word this morning, that your truth would settle in our hearts, that it would transform us and change us into the likeness of Jesus. Lord, hear our prayers. In the name of Christ. Amen. Let's sing together. Oh, how good it is. And we'll sing this one instead. <laughs> Please stand with me as you're able. Let us sing together. the timetable that uh, Jesus uh, spoke to his disciples saying, and you'll forgive 70 times 7, which was not a definitive number, it was uh, illustrative of over and over and over again, we continue to forgive just as God forgives us. Let us hear the word. Good morning church family. The reading this morning comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. <clears throat> so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. 
These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation of the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immoral immor immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarrelling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, the list goes on, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have now the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. This is the word of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit. I wonder how many sermons you've already heard on the fruit of the Spirit. For many of us, having grown up in the life of the church, we've probably heard the messages over and over again. And while this is going to be a nine-week series, it might not be nine weeks all in one block, we'll see how we go. But over the course of the remainder of this year, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Essentially, the evidence of Christ indwelling our lives. For what is defined by Paul as the fruit of the Spirit, and again, it's not a definitive list that it starts with love and ends with self-control. There are many other aspects of the character of Christ that we could name. But Paul lists these off to give us a comprehensive understanding of the contrast between human nature and Christ's nature. The contrast between living freely to follow our own selfish desires and living in the leadership of the Spirit of Christ in our lives and the contrasting evidence that those two aspects provide. So let's look at the context of what's unfolding here. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Galatia. It's a very confronting letter. He's getting in their face and saying, What's going on? After I left you, the wheels have fallen off. Let me correct what's happened here. We'll go to the next slide, thanks, Peter. You've been led astray by false teaching. Who is it that is interrupted? distorted what it was that I told you. I preached to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. That in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, our sins are forgiven. Who has come and distorted that teaching and led you astray? Let me bring you back to the straight and narrow. This is the essence of what Paul is saying to the church. You have begun prioritising the law over faith. Remember, I spoke to you about being children of Abraham. In contrast, the children of Abraham who are so bound to the law of Moses and live by the law rather than faith, they will be judged by the law. And there is not one person who can fulfil the law completely. Therefore, if you choose to live by the law rather than grace, 
if you choose to live by the Mosaic law rather than the grace of Jesus Christ, you will be judged by the law. Wouldn't you rather stand in grace rather than the law? Wake up, people, he's saying. Return to the gospel message of having faith in Jesus Christ, not faith in your own ability to fulfil every prescribed element of the law of Moses. You must learn again what it means to be children of God. Sons and daughters of Abraham. Why was Abraham considered to be right in God's eyes? Because he had faith. And if you are children of Abraham, you are children of faith. Faith in the living God who has sent Jesus Christ. And so Paul is reminding them who they are. Sons and daughters of the living God. Heirs of the kingdom that Christ has established. Joint heirs with Jesus. And he's saying to them, you need to recognise your rightful place as believers that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah who has now come. He has lived an earthly life. He has suffered for us. He has died the death of an innocent man and in so doing has taken our sins upon himself. Therefore, you are now considered to be sons and daughters of the living God if you believe. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the promised Saviour. And as children of the living God, you have a newfound freedom that you have never experienced before. And he goes on to speak about what it means to have freedom in Christ. It's not a liberty to do whatever we want willy-nilly, to follow our own selfish desires. It is a freedom to be who we are, to be real, to be authentic, to be earnest in our pursuit of holiness. Holiness that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying to them, you need to discover this freedom. You are no longer bound by law. You live in grace. You live in faith. And finally he says, that you are to experience the fullness of the Spirit of Christ in your lives. And when you give expression to the Holy Spirit's indwelling, then these are the characteristics that will be evident. And then he lists them off. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there are no laws. You are free. You are free to live your life in giving expression to these things, which not only bring life and hope and a sense of well-being to us, but to all whom we interact with. It spills over, just as Noel has shared, the outpouring of that life-giving water from the sponge. We can continue to soak it up in God's presence and allow it to flow out of our lives in our relationships with others. And this is truly the blessing of being children of Abraham, for the promise given to Abraham was that you are blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing to the nations. And in Jesus Christ, we step into the fullness of that blessing. That every blessing that God pours out upon us is not just for our own edification and sense of well-being, 
but that we might share that blessing with others. That we bear witness to the good things that God has done and continues to do in our lives. That we are evangelists. And an evangelist is one who shares the good news. We share with others the good news of what God has accomplished for us in the person of Jesus. And so that being the background and the context of Paul's letter to the Galatians, saying, hey, stop for a minute. And he uses the analogy of running a race. And he says, you're running a good race. And then someone cutting on you. They diverted the runner from the finish line to somewhere else. And Paul's saying, get back on track. Remember the gospel message I shared with you. It was simple, it was profound, it was life transforming. It does not hinge on law. It is grounded in grace and faith. And so Paul, in urging the church in Galatia to return to the true gospel message that he proclaimed, is saying, and now allow the Spirit to be fully evident in your lives. And so we begin the journey. The English language is greatly deficient when it comes to the word love. We have one word, love. However, in the Greek, there are four words that are used for love. And I want to share with you the different dimensions of these four words of love. First, there is philio. And you know the city, Philadelphia in the United States, the city of brotherly love. <clears throat> Philio, the Greek word means brotherly and sisterly love, of friendship and affection. That is a dimension of love that we share within the life of our church family. It's a love that many of us share with others in friendship. And then there is eros, the sexual love of passion, the love that is shared between a married couple, a husband and wife. Often, Eros gets a bad name in terms of being loved. And I want to simply say to you today that Eros as an expression of love is a beautiful expression of love in the context for which God has created it to be. God created us to share that love in the context of marriage. Then there is agape, the unconditional and sacrificial love that we are called to express. And this is the word that Paul uses in his writing to the church of Galatia. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Storge. This is a word that we don't often hear in the uh, description of love, but it's the familial love shared between parents and children. It's a nurturing love. It's a love of mutual regard, but recognising that the nature of relationship is different from friendship, although as parents and children we may grow into that expression of friendship love later in our lives. It's different from the eros love of the sexual expression and passion between a couple. And it's different from agape love. And let me return to defining a little more what agape love is. Uh, some pronounce it agape, some pronounce it agape. You choose how you want to uh, pronounce it. But this is a love that has no limits. It is a love that has no boundaries of, well, I'll give this much and no more. 
It is a love that is deep. It is a love that is evident by sacrifice. It's going the extra mile and another extra mile and another extra mile. Agape is a love that gives of oneself beyond whatever capacity we thought that we might have to love. Now take you back to the illustration that Nola gave us of the big sponge that looked as if it had a great potential to love. And the little sponge only appearing to have a small potential to love. And when I say love, I mean to give out the water that it holds. But the truth is that we are not the source of the love that we share. We don't manufacture it. We are not the origin and therefore the source of this love is an infinite resource for it is God. God is love. The being of God. If we could describe love in all of its perfection, that is God. And by the Holy Spirit, we are enabled to tap into the depth of this love, the infinite nature of this love. And so I want to share with you that love is life. Let me explain it this way. Love is luminous. It brings light. Love dispels darkness. The darkness of sin is overcome by the love of forgiveness. The darkness of the depth of being isolated from others, rejected by others, is overwhelmed and overcome by acceptance and the gathering in of being loved. The light of the love of God overcomes the darkness and the oppressiveness of feeling that we are unloved. Love is luminous. It brings light. It brings life. Love is indiscriminate. There are no demarcations. There are no boundaries of because I find this person lovable, I will love them. Because I find this person difficult to love, I will not love them. No, that's not agape love. Agape love is indiscriminate. I love you regardless. I love you regardless of what pain you might cause to me. I love you regardless of what offences you might have committed against someone else. I love you regardless of your attitude, which most of the time might stink, quite frankly. I love you regardless of how you look, of how you speak, and how you think, of the priorities in your life. I love you. And it brings into sharp focus the reality that God's love, agape love, is not primary, primarily an emotional expression. It's an act of our will. We will to love. We make a determination, a decision to love like God loves. And therefore there are no boundaries. There is no discrimination. We only have to stop and think about how unlovely we might be in God's eyes at times. Given the way we behave, the thoughts we have, the things we do, and yet God still loves us completely. And we 
take that image of God's love being indiscriminate and we give expression to that. Thirdly, it is free. There is no cost. And it takes us back to what Paul is seeking to address in the life of the church of Galatia where they're living under the law. The Protestant church was often accused of grounding its faith in good works, working hard, and at times living in the distortion of our good works accomplishing salvation. And some people think that if they're good, if they do good things, if they don't harm others, that that's the key to salvation. When we know that good works are evidence of the saving grace of God in our lives, they are not in themselves the key to salvation. It is the grace of God that saves. And because we recognise who we are in Jesus Christ, we seek to do good to others. There is no cost for God's love. It's not just for the rich. It's not just for those who can sacrifice more than others who might earn this love. Just as God's love for us is indiscriminate and our agape expression of love for others is also, then we need to recognise that it is free. Utterly, totally, absolutely free. All we need to do is accept it, receive it. I know I've used this illustration with you before, but Christmas Day. And for those who share Christmas with young children, you'll know only too well the excitement that builds. And you see all the presents under the tree. And we might take a gift that's for one of the children and give it to them. And it's theirs. And they know that it's theirs. But they can't enjoy the content of that beautifully wrapped parcel until they open it up, until they receive it. And that's how it is with this gift of God's love. We may know it up here, but until we accept it and receive it here, it can't transform our lives. Until we've received it. And it's free. And finally, love, the agape love, is extravagant. Now this might be a strange word to use with the expression of love. But I want to say to you that there is no more an extravagant expression of love than for someone to lay down their life for another. This is the gospel message of what Jesus Christ has done. And sadly, in times of war, where we send our troops off to fight, and they're doing it for the love of their country, men and women who lay down their lives as an expression of love for their nation and the freedom of their nation. Extravagant love. Some of us may be called to martyrdom, which may be the giving of our life and the suffering of ourselves for the sake of the gospel. Today, as we sit here quite comfortably, there are those who are faithful in their Christian discipleship to the point of death. Martyrs who are standing up for their faith in Jesus and are being persecuted for their faithfulness to God. We may not be brought to that point of challenge 
in our own lives. But we are still called to give expression to God's love extravagantly. And it takes us back to this nature of sacrifice. That I would give of myself to that extent in an expression of genuine love for the other that they would see Jesus. I had an experience a number of years ago where I suffered a very bad infection in my foot and uh, because of the uh, consequences of having been diabetic for a number of years I had no feeling in my foot and so I couldn't feel the pain of the infection until one morning I went to get out of bed and the pain shot up through my leg and I couldn't actually stand on my foot. My son took me to hospital and there I was rushed into uh, emergency and <coughs> They took me to surgery and as I was preparing for surgery to drain the infection out of my foot, the surgeon came to me and asked me to sign a piece of paper that said, in essence, these weren't the technical medical words, if the infection is worse than we think it is, we might have to take your foot off. Are you happy for us to do that? As I said, they weren't the words, are you happy for us to do that? But I had to sign sign. My gratitude and thankfulness to God, the skill of the surgeons and all those who cared for me, I still have both my right foot and my left foot and I am incredibly grateful. However, during the surgery I had a partial lung collapse and was raced off then to ICU and I was there for several days. And the United Church Minister, a hospital chaplain, she wasn't assigned to that hospital that I was in, but a friend of mine called her and asked if she would come. She came and sat with me, and she spoke with me and prayed with me, and she prayed for my little foot. And they were her words, Peter, I'm going to pray for your little foot. <laughs> Never have I experienced the presence of Christ so profoundly in the other. We talk about embodying Christ in how we live, that when people interact with us, they see Jesus. Reverend Jenny Bush, as she sat with me by my bedside, spoke with me and prayed. I recognise the presence of Jesus just in her being with me. My friends, this is who we are called to be, the presence of Jesus for us, that we would love them so unconditionally, so sacrificially, so extravagantly, so indiscriminately, that we would embody the love of Christ in our lives. That people would dare to say, I've seen Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your love is life. Life in all its fullness. Lord God, help us to be bearers of this life-giving gift. That we would love as you love. And there is no way that we can do this in and of ourselves. But empowered by your Spirit. Inspired by your love for us. God, help us to continue to grow into the fullness of of all that you are calling us to be as disciples of Jesus Christ and as your community of faith here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing.
You stand with me as you are able. Let us sing together. Hatred has taken the place of love. Distrust and discord have broken the bonds of love. On the global geopolitical stage, as people wage war against each other, God, we pray for peace. In the context of of our family homes and those across our suburb. We pray for peace and reconciliation. We continue to uphold those who are a part of our church family who are struggling at this time with ill health, with incapacity, with loss. God, may each one know your peaceful and loving presence with them, your loving arms around them, the sure and certain hope that you provide for their future. Lord God, we pray for ourselves as your church here in this place, in partnership with all the communities of faith across this city, that we would proclaim your love to the city of Gold Coast and beyond. That these would not just be words of our mouths, 
but would be expressions of our hearts. Lord, we pray for your love, your healing, and your hope to be hallmarks of who we are as your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we conclude our time of gathered worship, recognising that our worship of the Lord goes on into this week as it unfolds. We are the community of faith gathered here now, but we are the community of faith scattered to be God's people in the world over this coming week. Let there be love shared among us. Let's stand together and sing. Say to one another, God loves you. And if you feel that it's appropriate, you can say, and I love you. Um, whether you know the other person or not, I encourage you to do that. Let's, uh, let's greet each other this morning as we go out for morning tea.